It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Over the weekend, saw George Stephanopoulos uh, had a quote that grabbed my attention on where we are today politically. And, you know, as we've been talking about, you know, the Trump era brought us a, a level of acceptance of, well, let's say individual flaws that history has never allowed in the past. Uh, the, the Republican base has given Trump more passes, well, than, <laughs> than Trump has made. Um, and, and, and Stephanopoulos hit on this. He said, quote, the scale of the abnormality is staggering. Uh, it, that it can become, that actually become numbing. Uh, he says, it's all too easy to fall into reflexive habits, to treat this as a normal campaign where both sides are embraced, uh, the rule of law, where both sides are dedicated uh, to a debate based on facts and the peaceful transfer of power. He says, but that's not just what's happening in this election year. And, and look, this has been this has been moving in this direction for a while. And Republicans learned, and I, I've I've made this statement a number of times over the years. That you go back to 2011, uh, when Scott Walker did all that in Wisconsin, you had you know the hundred thousand people in the Capitol. We were there for for two weeks uh, at the beginning of it, you know, covering that covered it the whole time. Uh, but I remember saying, look, uh, the the you know time and repetition of pushing the right wing agenda, of pushing the message, of staying the course, not about not apologizing, not backing up getting the base used to yeah they're we're gonna we're gonna break norms we're gonna break the rules we're gonna do whatever we want to get our ours our agenda passed and then we're just going to abuse people and you go back through the recall that happened in wisconsin and i remember talking to people who were like i just want it to stop i just want all of the fighting all of the bickering i just want it to stop i don't care they got to the point to where they didn't care what the outcome was, let, let, let Walker do whatever he wants, was the message I got from people after that recall, because it had been, you know, like a year and a half, almost two years of solid, just, you know, every day at dinner, the phone ringing, every day in the mailbox there being something, and people just wanted the pain to stop. And this is, this is, the, this is when Republicans learned, you know, you know, the, the spaghetti theory. You throw enough of it at the wall, some of it sticks, and then people are used to just cleaning up the you-know-what. And it got me to thinking, you know, after watching the Trump responses last week, and as I said on Friday, I, I think this that Trump has shown us that he's kind of a whiner in a, in a horrible way. Not a good whiner either. Not a fun whiner. But, you know, just a childish, just a whiner. And if you're going to be an authoritarian, you're going to be a dictator. I don't know that being whiny is is the thing. But, you know, as I was thinking, you know, he has done so much stuff that and this is not new. I'm not I'm not breaking any new ground here. But there's been so much scandal around him that it would have crushed anyone else a long time ago. You know, a hundred scandals ago, it would have been over. And I started thinking about some of those, you know, going back to 1952 and Adelaide Stevenson, where, you know, he ran for, for president against Nixon, or I mean, against Eisenhower and Nixon in 52 and 56, uh, faced allegations that he was cheating on his wife. That was the thing. And it was like, oh, my gosh. And whether he was or not, we don't really know. But just that allegation. Uh, Nixon, in his 60 campaign, when he ran for president, uh, he faced allegations of financial wheelings and dealings. Uh, they they believe part of that contributed to his loss uh, against Kennedy. Now, again, you know, nobody was found guilty. There was no no crimes yet. Um, but but hurt him, hurt his campaign, hurt his. Uh, and then some of them it just crushed. And look at Thomas Eagleton uh, for the fact that he said at one point he he, he sought electroshock therapy for depression. Uh, was better now. 
uh, but had to withdraw as the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 72 because he had a mental illness, which just cr- and I look at I look at Trump and I'm going, you know, I'm sure there's a, you know, a, a, an association somewhere where the psychiatrists are going. Yeah, there's a bunch of them here. Uh, but there's a lot of these folks. I mean, you go back to Wilbur Mills in 72, uh, was a presidential candidate or potential candidate. And, you know, he was involved in, you know, yeah, he had a, a stripper <laughs> uh, in the car during a traffic stop in D.C. Uh, Ed Muskie uh, was accused of crying in New Hampshire. And, well, you know, he's not stable. And that hurt him. Uh, you know, the big one, you know, 1988, Gary Hart it completely ended his campaign because he had an affair. Of which, you know, you got Donald Trump, who's had a couple, you know, one while the, the wife, the, 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 new, the wife is pregnant, uh, a, you know, convicted of, you know, some assault stuff, um, said out loud, you know, I just, you know, <laughs> I just attack him like a you know what, I grab him by the you know what, and the base embraced it. Yes, I saw women wearing shirts. You can grab me by the you know. It's crazy what this this guy has gotten away with, the favor that they have given him. You know, I think about Michael Dukakis just looking weak, small in a tank with a helmet on. And, of course, the, the Willie Horton thing. That tanked his, his political career. Gary Condit didn't actually do anything. His intern disappeared. <laughs> Done. Uh, there was a thought that, you know, he could have maybe possibly, I don't know, Look what happened to John Kerry with the whole swift boating thing. They literally turned a guy with purple hearts into um, a coward. They, had, during the convention, had purple heart band-aids mocking the purple heart. Think about that. Now, again, these are the people who tell us they love the military. So it's got me thinking, you know, if, if imagine if Watergate had happened today. There would have been no, there would have been nothing. Oh, that's mild compared to what Trump has done. And look, they're trying to rewrite the history of Watergate by claiming that, you know, the CIA set Nixon up. They did all this. This was a, it's a false flag. I mean, you stop and think about the scandals of the past, the, you know, the, the Abscam scam, where you had uh, several members of Congress in the late 70s, early 80s, who uh, in an FBI sting got caught on tape accepting bribes. Uh, a number of them were convicted, ruined their careers. We had an administration for four years who ran a hotel. I got to thinking about, you know, Marion Barry. They got him, you know, smoking crack. I, I got to imagine, is that too far today? Spitzer um, was involved with a prostitute. We got a guy on trial right now for paying off a porn star. Ruined Spitzer's career. Uh, Anthony Weiner showed, well, well, you know, uh, he deserved that. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you stop and you think about, you know, Mark Sanford, for instance, you know, uh, off on the Appalachian Trail with his mistress. I guess all that would be okay today. I guess none of this stuff matters anymore. And look, I'm okay with, with doing away with, I, I don't care who's having an affairs. I don't care who's doing any of that stuff. I want to know about policy. Because you know what we're not talking about in any of this? What Donald Trump's actually going to do as president. And what he has said he's going to do is really bad. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, China is taking an aggressive tone. When we come back, our resident expert is going to share some thoughts. Back after this. Stick around. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. 
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So an interesting article over at CNN. Uh, Anthony Blinken was in China. Uh, had a little meeting with Xi Jinping and the uh, the Chinese there about our, our relationships. And uh, interesting kind of themes coming out of it. Uh, this binary choice of you're with us or you're against us, China taking a, a really dug in position of saying, look, you know, hey, we can move together as adversaries or over here, uh, you know, and I found it interesting that that they've taken such a dug in kind of really uh, aggressive stance, given the fact that, you know, where we are. Uh, that's why I've asked our good friend Emily De La Brie to come talk with us. Uh, she is the co-founder of Horizon Advisory. Uh, they focus on this very issue and maybe what we do to kind of move in a positive direction. Emily, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you for having me. So, what do you what do you make of this meeting with uh, with Blinken and the the Chinese equal and ultimately Xi Jinping? And this kind of what I see is maybe I'm wrong. I see this as they've given us a binary choice. You continue the way things are and make us happy or or the stick. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. And they're doing it because China has the leverage right now. And I think that this is like the inconvenient truth that isn't in the media coverage very much in the U.S. and certainly isn't in how the Biden administration is framing this visit. But China's in the catbird seat. And they're especially in the catbird seat right now because we're a couple months out from an election. And Beijing knows and the Biden administration knows that if China wants to, they could tank the US economy, for example, and ruin the Biden administration's chance of reelection. Um, and that's just one way they have leverage, but that's just so clear. And so they're saying, hey, sorry, we're in charge. Now, I find it interesting because I was just reading a piece today from uh, the China Daily uh, that, you know, talked about, you know, the, the U.S. is four pronged attack on our uh, on China. And, you know, they say, look, you know, the, this trade war and they're now calling it a trade war. Uh, they're saying, look, it was initiated by Donald Trump and the Trump administration uh, was all out all around. This is what they wrote all around strategic competition with China, with administrations uh, develop developing that into concept of decoupling. Uh, they talked about the fact that we're, we're we're repeating the same mistakes during the Cold War. And, you know, even though Biden says he doesn't want to do that. Uh, they're they're reactivating a military domestic style system, and of course they're promoting their ideology. You know, maybe don't use slave labor. And it seems like you know they're ready. They're moving their people in a direction for another kind of Cold War footing. Yeah, China's ready to fight. And honestly, that's not a surprise, right? China's the one who started this war we're in. They might say it's the Trump administration's trade war. They might say that Biden's now containing China, but all of it responds to what Beijing's been doing for decades, and especially really for the past decade, which is break international rules, whether those are ideological rules or trade rules or um, you know security, territorial, legal issues, um, and try to establish global control. And that's what the U.S. response is a function of. Um, so no, we shouldn't be surprised that China's on wartime footing. That said, Beijing is very good at messaging to say that the aggression is coming from the U.S. side. 
you know, um, I go back to what we said a second ago, this binary choice of either we, you know, we can, we maintain, you know, this, what we're doing, uh, them taking all of our jobs, dominating the global manufacturing market and, and basically cornering the market on, on production, especially when you're talking about EVs and the next generation technology, or there's all this bad stuff. And, and it doesn't, it, one, doesn't have to be this way, but it seems like it's them setting the agenda, whereas Biden seems to me to be, and, and I don't want to use weak on this, but you know he's trying to tread that water of hey I don't want a full scale war but we've got to reshore some manufacturing coming out of the pandemic we've got to shore up our our supply chains uh, we've got to do some things without doing what you just said triggering a full out war and and then you know tanking the U S economy yeah and I think there are two big things there one is that the U S being a democracy just has constraints on it even having recognized China's threat that Beijing doesn't have. So the Biden administration knows that like, after a certain point, there are going to be costs to the American population um, if you confront China, because China is going to make sure those costs are there and that's going to be hard and that might hurt them as an administration, even if it's the right thing to do in the long term. Beijing doesn't deal with that. They want to do something and involves their people starving. They're going to let their people starve. And that's not a huge issue. So that's one big thing, right? And that lets China set the agenda because they're they can be out there and they can be aggressive. Um, no, and, and they a perfect example. If I, could, if I could cut you off for a second, yeah, no, a perfect please. example is the fact that you go into some of their factories and they've got suicide nets in the in the stairwells. Uh, they've got you know basically company towns, but they're government towns where if you work in the factory, you live and work in that place, and there's nothing else. We're here in the U.S. We're we're, we're, you know, unions still are somewhat legal and we're seeing a lot of activity around that. Uh, but the conditions there, we would never tolerate. And, you know, I think most of us don't even know. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a very different environment that, you know, we, we wouldn't put up with. Yeah, we have laws and we have rules, too. And all of those mean that it's a lot harder to be out there and be the one setting the agenda in this kind of a conversation. Especially because China knows our rules, right? And they know how we operate. So they can put us in positions where I think it's going to be really difficult for us to respond or to compete or to engage. But this is where I think educating the American people on look and because I look at this TikTok thing and I, I've had people say, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's not a big deal. I'm going, no, it kind of is a big deal. Uh, it's kind of a big deal to me because I think, you know, as a kid growing up in the last Cold War, uh, I can't imagine my parents generation or my friends parents allowing uh, a direct line from the Kremlin into every bedroom in this country uh, via video crack. I can't imagine that that would have happened during during my childhood. And yet, that's what we've got today. You've got this 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 TikTok, this video crack in every kid's hand across this country. And parents don't most of them don't even know or, or don't think they can do anything about it. Which is why I think it's interesting that the administration has signed a bill to either make them divest, make the Chinese Communist government divest, or or ban TikTok. I'm in the ban category because we've got to start somewhere. And this seems to me, uh, maybe you're, maybe you've got a different thought, but this seems to me to be that first battleground on on where we're going to head. Agree entirely. And I also think that you're absolutely right on the education front. And you can see the world, the U.S. at this point, across the aisle, across parts of the U.S. knows that we have to compete with China, but people aren't ready for the cost of that because the stakes and the reality of this competition just aren't clear. And that means that Washington, really Biden administration, but administrations that came before too, find themselves in this position of having to do gymnastics because they have to say we're tough on China and they want to be tough on China, but they can also only go so far because that might hurt them with the population. And I don't envy them, right? Like this is a situation where you need a wartime president and you need someone who's going to say, okay, well, we're going to have to shoulder these costs and deal with it and my popularity be damned or you need a population that's going to say we're okay with it, those costs because we know what's at stake now here's the thing we're in this position where we've got two guys uh i i have already said i'm voting for joe biden i already know that because of all the the very positive things he's done on the labor front all the positive things he's done on the the economic front to move us away from neoliberalism and a lot of the, the devastation that happened over the last 40 years to working people but this china issue uh, is part of that on, on a certain level, but it's also 
uh, something where I've got my my red hat friends who are working class folks who think Trump's the guy. China admits he started this. Um, but I look at Mr. Art of the deal and I go, you know, I look at the last bad deal he tried to make. It didn't work. I don't see any of his deals working. Um, this looks like a, a, a campaign issue as well, you know, to try and get people to go, OK, as a country, which way are we going? And I think that no matter what, China will be the issue of this campaign or at least one of the issues of this campaign. And it was in the Republican primary. To the extent that there were candidates on the debate stage, it was China, China, China. Um, oh, so there, I think there, that, were, there were Republican debates? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I might be the only one who watched them. Did, did I miss something? <laughs> oh, that's right. The, the kids table. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. They, they did talk about it, but sadly, nobody was paying attention. Yeah, exactly. And then it's tough because, I mean, also like Trump's legacy on China, he changed the conversation. No matter what you think about him, like, that's the case. There was, we were friends, we're kind of partners with China, they do some things wrong, but whatever, that's how the world works before. And then there was like, we're in a competition with China. And absolutely, the trade deal didn't work. Um, there's no question of that either. But like, there was a real narrative shift. And it was continued and picked up by the Biden administration. But so you have two candidates out there who are both going to say, like, we're the ones who are tough on China. Yeah, I mean, look, I give, I do give Trump credit for for changing the, the conversation on that. But I also think Bernie Sanders, had he been the candidate in 2016, who was saying almost the exact same thing, but with different different policy ideas, uh, would have done, you know, I think better uh, in 2016, because I think the country was ready for this. I think we were in a moment where, you know, working people are angry. You know, in 2022, we, we, we did a working class heroes tour, went across several states, uh, visited places that used to be. Uh, they used to manufacture glass. They used to manufacture rubber and, you know, down the list. And it used to be somewhere people wanted to live. And now, sadly, all that manufacturing has gone. And those those are places that used to be. And the credit that I've been giving Biden is they're trying to bring some some manufacturing back. They're trying to invest in future technologies to make those used to be's gonna be's. And I think that's an important thing, an important distinction of what Trump did compared to what Biden actually did. Yeah, and because you raise Bernie Sanders, one thing that I think is critical on Sanders, he voted against and was really vocal against China's accession to the World Trade Organization and granting China permanent normal trade relations status. And that's a conversation that I like to think isn't over um, and where it's worth saying, OK, actually, there were people there who are at the vanguard and knew that this was the wrong call. And oh, wait, look where we are now. Yeah, see, I, I say this all the time. Um, I don't think our trade policy is broken. I think it is working exactly the way it was supposed to. Just like I don't think our tax policies are broken. I think they are working exactly the way they're supposed to. They're benefiting a handful at the cost of everybody else. We just weren't allowed in on the information. Uh, I believe they war gamed all this stuff out. They knew what they were doing and it has worked perfectly into their favor. The, the, the downside for them now is they didn't think long term enough that eventually the pitchforks might come out. Uh, and and I, I'm still waiting to see if that happens and it may. Uh, but but something, ha you know, and this is where I get Biden credit. Uh, something has to be done and they're they're moving toward that. I think also that's where the China question is interesting, because the people who made money on China, the people in America who made money on China, who weren't the people who lost their jobs or their factories, their runways running out, too, because China's not in a game to make sure that America ever makes money as long as China can avoid it. So people in finance who are making money off of deals in China, the people who are shipping factories to China, they're all now getting squeezed out or going to get squeezed out of the Chinese market. And that, I mean, for better for worse, or for worse, is going to be an interesting or a positive, I think, convergence of interests. Because at a certain point, ideally, you have people wake up to the fact that China is in no one in America's interests. And the question is, does that wake up happen before it's too late or not? Yeah, but I, again, I come back to this 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 TikTok thing, and I, I have to tell you that I am I'm literally stunned and amazed uh, when I when people that I've known for years are are on the the China side of this issue, 
and having it framed in the Chinese communist government's language. And, and again, I go back to this idea of time and repetition. I know this is what they've been sold. This is what it's constantly in their ear on right wing radio and cable news and all of that. But I, I come back to this. This this issue has shocked me in ways that I, uh, I, I quite frankly didn't think was possible. But the bill passed. No, no, that, that's, that's, that's the I'm part. shocked by that, honestly. Yeah. I, I said, nope, there's no chance that this happens. No, I agree with you. And uh, my, 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 my problem I keep coming back to is the number of people that I meet every day who, who think that this is an actual issue uh, that we're on the wrong side of. And I'm going, man, uh, the American first crowd has kind of lost their minds. And, and, and I go to this place, is this, um, you know, we have to have our red hat, blue hat. If this is the blue hats doing something, we reflexively have to be against it. Or, you know, is this, you know, truly the ideology that they're pushing? I'm not quite sure yet. And also, why can't we just be like, okay, China's bad? <laughs> well, the Chinese, That's, it's the so Chinese easy. government is bad. Right? It's so easy. If only we had maybe a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> No, I, I get yelled at all the time because I've, I've got a sticker on my laptop that says, you know, a China, a right to work state since, uh, you know, communist China, a right to work state since 1947. And everyone says, you've got communism on your laptop. I go, yeah, but you got to read the rest of the whole, the whole context. Uh, <laughs> you need something a little more obvious. There you go. So last question I've got for you on this, because uh, clearly this is something we're going to be talking about long into the future because this isn't going away. You're right. This will be a major campaign issue. Uh, we get to hear, you know, when Trump's not in court, uh, we get to hear him say China, uh, you know, a, a billion times. If you're in the administration, you know, what or if you're in the Trump camp, um, what is is a, is a way forward that you think the American people would would take? Because you're right. We're going to have to buy in on on the pain and suffering that will come out of this. Um, what is What is that that direction then? I mean, I think that if you are in the White House, you have to lead with action. Right. And you have you you can't say we're just going to educate and we're going to educate and then we're going to act. We've been doing that. And there hasn't been a whole lot of action. I say you start by revoking China's permanent normal trade relations status. Um, part of the issue, it's not just that our system is either broken or skewed. It's that we're letting China into a system when China's breaking the rules. And the way you start is you take China out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, here's the thing. I, I never believed that they would follow the rules. And this is where I guess maybe I'm just jaded and have been jaded since I was a child. Uh, when they were making the arguments that, you know, life is going to get better there and we're going to have access to that market. And it's going to be this all kind of wonderful uh, and American capitalism is going to thrive and democracy. I'm like, no, that's never going to happen. Uh, we're just going to lose jobs because that's cheap labor. And that's what it's turned out to be. Yeah. And it was pretty damn clear then but it's time at least to reverse course on that front now that it's been proven to have been a mistake there you go uh emily i appreciate you sharing some thoughts uh, i hope that you'll come back and, and keep us up to date on what's going on and as this continues because again don't see it going anywhere anytime soon uh, but i appreciate the time i'll be here thank you our good friend emily de la Bria. make sure you check out their work over at Horizon Advisory. We'll get links out on social media. I want to hear your thoughts. Um, is now the time? Do you think the American people are ready for what could happen in the event that an actual Cold War that we admit has been going is going on happens? You think we're ready for it? Rick at the RickSmithShow.com. Right back after this. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So over the weekend, potentially, potentially the last correspondence dinner uh, that we'll see for a while. Because you remember during the Trump years, no uh, no press correspondence dinners. I uh, didn't, didn't quite like him. And look, you know, in his defense, in Trump's defense, uh, when he got skewered during the Obama years, I'm sure everyone remembers that. Um, I can I can see that wouldn't be friendly territory for him, uh, but you know President Biden did did give a good uh, a good speech. Uh, Colin Jost was terrible, uh, but the line that's getting attention, uh, Biden said the 2024 election is in full swing, and yes, age is an issue. 
He says, I'm a grown man running against a six-year-old. Uh, very true. Uh, he says, age is the only thing we have in common. And this was the punchline. Uh, my vice president actually endorses me. Quite true as well. But here to share some thoughts on are these correspondence dinners. Uh, do they mean anything? And would it matter if this were the last one? Uh, and maybe some of the, uh, the, the insanity that happened last week and what we've got coming up. Best our good friend Bob Nay to come talk with us. Bob is former Ohio congressman, political analyst. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Oh, thank you, Rick. So what do you think of the president's uh, spiel at the correspondence dinner? Well, I've been to many correspondence dinners. Now, the food is okay. Uh, now, the dinners I went to when Newt Gingrich was a speaker were my favorites. You know why? Why? Newt quit wearing suit or tuxedos and wore suits to events. Okay. So it gave us all the license to, you know, wear a suit. So we went to correspondence dinners and we weren't in tuxedos. You know how uncomfortable those are. That's the part I hate about them. But over the years, I went to some good ones. You know, of course, there was um, Obama was hilarious at the dinners. And, um, and, and Bush did okay. Trump quit going. So, you know, we didn't do those. But... Uh, Colin Jost was so lame, and I watch him on SNL, but wow, that one fell flat. Yeah. President had two two punchlines, but, you know, the dinners are the dinners. Uh, you, you see the famous uh, people. You see a lot of Hollywood pretty people. And so if you go to them, I mean, it's it's an interact. I think it's more interesting to be at the dinner than it is to watch it. Yeah, because <laughs> you're watching all the other people and their reactions. Um, right. Yeah, you because know, because it is kind of just the big incestuous pool of uh, of the the wealthy and powerful, I guess. Because for me right. to go, look, I mean, if you wanted to bring me, I, one of the unions years ago had their their big event, and they did a baseball theme. To where I was like going to the ballpark, they had hot dogs and you know popcorn, and you showed up in jerseys and stuff, in sweatpants. I mean, that's my kind of place. Tuxedo? No, no, I'm I'm not even. I am not going under any circumstances. Uh, so I wouldn't miss it if it were gone, but I got to tell you that being said, I don't, I don't want Trump president. Uh, so, so there, there is also, also that got to get your thoughts on, uh, uh, last week's, uh, Supreme court, uh, whatever that was. Uh, I look at the statement by, uh, by Greg Sargent in his piece over at the, the Washington post. He said, J. Michael Ludig, uh, the judge sees two potential outcomes from Thursday's Supreme court arguments and both. Both are grim for democracy, and, and I, I tend to agree uh, that what the Supreme Court could, could come up with, not not good for we the people. Well, I watch this with interest because I, I hate to predict the Supreme Court anymore. I mean, it's more predictable with conservative justices, but it still has some parts to it that are the whole legalese world, and this shifts and that shifts legally. And what I mean by that, it's kind of shocking just for the – non-lawyer eye when you look at the fact that trump's lawyers went in and used a scenario of immunity that a president could basically commit assassinations and be immune now one of the justices asked you know some questions about that saying you mean the president could uh, have an assassination carried out on a political enemy and be immune so you know you see that line of questioning now it makes me think why would Trump's lawyers, is it because they're inept, but why would they go into the Supreme Court with some of the arguments they went in with? And then the lawyers admitted that Trump potentially didn't have immunity on certain things, which would be purely political functions. So those two things happen. And I'm thinking, why would they do that? But I think there's a whole convoluted legal system here where the court then says, Hmm. The lawyers have presented that a president can carry out an assassination and have immunity. Do we think that's right or wrong? They think it's wrong. But do we think that the president giving a speech is immune? And so the justices, in a way, are starting to weigh in on this particular item or that particular item. Then it becomes a novel, Rick, where this is immune, this isn't, this is immune, this isn't. So I think this leads to this whole cluster of legal ideas that were presented last week that then potentially gets kicked back to other courts. And then those other courts make some decisions, lower courts, 
and then it gets kicked to the Supreme Court. Now, the one thing that clearly comes out of that whole legal jumblees I just went through is this entire immunity case probably forces the federal components of trial that Trump is under to be stalled to after the election. That's, I think, the bottom line of that whole mess last no, I agree. And, and, and it, but here's the thing. I said from the beginning, that was always going to happen. Uh, they were always going to drag their feet out on this, and this is just the way that they went. But, you know, what mm -hmm. happens if the Supreme Court goes, yeah, the president's got immunity, and the only thing that we can do to him is impeachment? Because this was the other argument that, that caught my attention. The mm -hmm. only... The only punishment for for literally shooting someone on Fifth Avenue would be impeachment by the by Congress, not not criminal right. courts. And I, I or, or did I hear this? Am I getting this wrong? No, I think you're I mean, that's another option that would be out there. I think legally the the whole thing is a train wreck and they're in uncharted territory. So anything they do is is brand new. But it's got to force the Justice Department, I think, right now to be thinking, you know, if the Supreme Court kicks this to a lower court and lower court has partial immunity, then the department would have to go back and retool the indictments. They would have to probably alter them. And you know how that system would work. So bottom line is, I don't know how this is going to come out. But I don't believe there's going to be a federal trial on Trump. Manhattan, you know, and Georgia are going to be the trials. See, now, while, while I don't, and this is where I'm going to get into some trouble, I guess, um, while I don't want presidents convicted for making mistakes, um, you know, there has to be some criminal liability when you literally break the law. An example, for instance, you know, I think George W. Bush lied us into a war uh, in, in Iraq and in, Af in, in Iraq, at least, I think the whole aluminum tubes thing, I think all of that, uh, all of that predicated on lie after lie after lie. Um, you know, and you could say, well, he did it for his own, his own gain because the wartime footing president, you can make up a whole reasons why politically that would benefit him. You could even maybe come up with reasons that Dick Cheney made money from Halliburton. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff here. Should he be criminally prosecuted? for making that horrible judgment or is this just bad policy bad judgment uh because we haven't in the past done this and gone after presidents in the in the years after uh or is this or do you see all of this as very different well i mean that that's another thing that's you know uh, under under debate and that's a bigger picture too and i mean and on the personal level you know i did uh i got um 30 months for the falsification of a federal document, which was an in-house congressional travel form, by the way. And uh, on that form, I lied about the cost of the trip. I filed the trip, but I lied. And like I said many times, I lied. No one died. Now, as a member of Congress, before I, I resigned from Congress, I sat there a few years before and watch these clowns on the floor of the house. I think there were six of them, if I remember right, Rick. And I wish I could tell you today, uh, I'd be arrested if I would, but what I saw. Now, obviously, everything I saw, although I can't tell you, was a lie. Nobody, I mean, we're talking, you're talking a presidential level, bring the six clowns that, that caused this disaster to occur in Iraq and the death of over 100,000 some people we didn't even go after them when we clearly could have. So how does anybody think we're going to go after a president? I mean, this almost makes presidents, if if it's blanket immunity, to the level where they could assassinate uh, a political enemy and get away with it. Yeah, I mean, because the reason I ask is we haven't gone back after and, and prosecuted presidents, right. you know, all under the guise of, well, let, let sleeping dogs lie. You know, we'll move forward, we'll move on. And, you know, because I'm, I'm getting this from a lot of people who are saying, look, why is Trump different? And I said, well, you know, the other ones, you could make an argument on a certain level that they thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were making the right decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I kind of believe Bush thought he may have been making the right decision. 
Um, and I'm, I'm more willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. I saw with my own eyes, you know, Donald Trump rile that crowd up and, and, and point them in the direction. I'm going to lead you and point them into the direction of the Capitol. Um, th- that to me, th- that's the smoking gun. Right. Because, because, you know, when it comes to the, the Iraq situation, I, I voted to allow him to do full, full force. Uh, so did Hillary Clinton and John Kerry and Bernie Sanders didn't. But, but you know, a lot of us did both sides of the aisle. So, you know, I, I do believe that Bush did what we did, looked at the information and said, wow, you know, with Trump's case, you, you know, he's on videotape saying, let's go down to the Capitol. Um, and of course, he didn't go. Yeah. But he said, you know, I'll, I'll meet you down there or whatever, however he said it. So how the court comes down on this eventually, probably there'll be some form of a decision. But again, this absolutely has affected the Trump trials. No question about it. Yeah, we'll see where this goes. Last week also it came out uh, several states are finally, finally uh, going after these so-called fake electors or or as the, the right wing is trying to spin it, alternative electors. Uh, like there is a legal alternative to the people who were certified. Uh, but at least four of the seven swing states, uh, you know, the ones that are going to decide this upcoming election, uh, they've got active criminal cases into the pro-Trump fake electors. Uh, any any thoughts first before we jump into if, if there are such a thing as alternatives and in history, have we had this? Well, from uh, 2000. Uh, one, on, I had uh, chaired the House Administration Committee. We oversaw federal election law. I can't recall one single time. And by the way, I was on the Electoral College 2004. Cheney was the vice president. We were down front. Uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones, the late congresswoman from Cleveland, stood up and protested the, you know, the, uh, the election. And we decided how much debate time was out there. And during that whole process, I don't remember backup electors. I don't remember Stephanie Tubbs Jones having backup electors. And I say that because Stephanie came to me, uh, you know, in my office and said, look, I'm going to do this. And there weren't conversations about, well, you know, if you do this and there's backup electors, I've never known that at least, I mean, maybe I'm ignorant uh, of things I should know about, but I don't re- ever recall any form of a discussion I ever heard, and I, like I said, I oversaw federal election law, of backup electors. Now, I think the criminal cases that are out there now probably have a lot more fingers than we know right now. And why I say that is, once they start a criminal case, they'll look at the emails. They'll look at the, at, you know, the contacts made. Were there sources of money put behind this? Was it a conspiracy to commit fraud? Uh, was money utilized to do that? Was it across state lines? What were the communications between these people that were to be the false electors? Or were they chosen by ringleaders who set it up to commit fraud? So there's a lot, I think, to the criminal cases. And probably you're going to see some uh, some plea deals on them, I bet. Now, I did find it interesting, at least in Michigan and Arizona, um, you know, unindicted co-conspirator, co-conspirator number one is Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if right. you're right, and, 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 and these emails and these phone calls and all this stuff move in a direction that goes upward, it's possible some charges could come his way, no? Well, I mean, it could if if they have something direct from him. They would need something, you know, he's got surrogates. So they would need something from him to the surrogates saying, do this or do that, you know. The guy that seems to stumble into all of these Rudy is Rudy Giuliani. Rudy. Now, yeah. Somehow, one thing I can predict to you, I don't know about Trump or the surrogates that he had. Rudy will have to do a plea out of one of these. I I can predict that to you. Does does Rudy sing? I mean, does he does he turn into it? Does, does Rudy rat? I don't know. Rudy's broke. I I don't know what he's gonna do at this point in time, you know? He's not gonna have beer money. I mean I that's know. Wow. It's going to be tough. So, I, but for me, I'm going, you know, okay, good. You've, you've finally gone in this direction. We're like two years too late, I think. I mean, you know, this is one of those things oh, yeah. where the day you turned in the thing, you go, this isn't right. Uh, you, what? 
put your hands on the car, spread them. We're, we're taking you in. Well, what amazes me the most is are the time frames on this. And Trump has successfully, in the court of public opinion, been able to say, you know, even in Stormy Daniels' case, five years ago, you know, Cohen pled guilty to the the whole fraudulent payments of Stormy Daniels. Why five years later? And, you know, the government turns slowly, justice, lawyers, etc. And I think with, you know, these electors, it, it does bring to mind of, you know, why didn't somebody just move faster on this stuff? You know, uh, even January the 6th, yep. uh, the wheels yep. turned slow and it kind of, you know, whether it was done intentionally or not is not important. It feeds into the they waited to get me syndrome. Does that help that's him, do you think? Does this, does this help Trump in the long run, do you well, think? This idea that legally, he's the victim? Legally, it doesn't legally help him, but all of these cases at one time, I think, helps to, you know, give him some credibility to be able to say, hey, you know, they're after me. They can't get me at the ballot box, so they want to get me here. Now, the outcome eventually could be different legally, but it it probably doesn't cost him votes it probably helps him. I don't think it gains him votes, but it neutralizes the whole court process. Look, normally, if you have a former president of the United States, normally, in courtrooms with 91 indictments, uh, the party's over with. doesn't matter what the trial says. This is a different scenario. No, as I started off with earlier in the, in the show, you know, it goes back to what George Stephanopoulos talked about on Sunday. You know, the, he said, you know, the scale of the abnormality yeah, yeah. is so staggering that it has actually become numbing. He says it's it's all too easy to fall into reflexive habits to treat this as a normal campaign where both sides embrace the rule of law, where both sides are dedicated to a debate based on facts and peaceful transfer of power. But that's that's not right. what's happening this election year. And none of this what? is normal. And we're trying to normalize this because you're right. If this is any other campaign in the history of campaigns, uh, Trump's out on his ear. I mean, you look at Howard Dean. He he screamed the wrong way and he got yeah. thrown shown the door. Right, right. I mean, there have been incidents. One candidate years ago, was it Musky? He cried. Somebody said something about his mother. He was done, you know whoever that candidate was, I, I spent a, I spent a good half hour on the phone yesterday with a longtime friend of mine and we went to college together and she called and of course her, her voice level was getting higher and higher, higher. How could possibly Trump survive this? How could possibly Trump survive that? How could the poll, you know, this was on and on. So I tried to explain case by case. And the more I tried to explain it, the more messed up it was because it doesn't fit into, you're right, it's abnormal. It doesn't fit into regular political molds. Yeah. And that's why, you know, get out the vote, target your audience. I think target the audience and find out who they are and get them out to vote is probably a bigger deal than it's ever been in in decades. So it's it's not your normal political process. I'm by right any there with you. Imagine. This is the weirdest election in modern American history. Uh, that, that, my friend, an understatement. And on that, we will leave it here. Bob, as always, I appreciate the time and the insight. Great Thank stuff. You. Thank you. Our good friend, Bob Nay. I want to hear your thoughts. Do you agree? Uh, do you think that the things are so unusual that we're all numb to it, that the, the, the goings on are so bizarre that we're just trying to find our way through? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Quick break. Right back to wrap things up. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1899. That was the day that Idaho miners detonated 50 cases of dynamite at the Bunker Hill and Sullivan Mine in Wardner. For nearly a decade, Idaho miners and owners had been locked in a bitter battle in the Coeur d'Alene district. The mining companies fought against unionization. They hired Pinkerton detectives to infiltrate union meetings and fire those who dared to hold a union card. 
In 1893, the Western Federation of Miners was founded and became a major organizing union in the region. Bunker Hill remained non-union, drawing the ire of workers in the surrounding mines. A group of miners took over a train and loaded it with dynamite. The Western Federation of Miners paper, the Idaho State Tribune, described what happened next, writing, quote, A detachment of Union miners armed with Winchester rifles was dispatched to the mountainside beyond the mill and the work of placing under the mill the 3,000 pounds of dynamite taken from the magazine of the Frisco mine at Gem was commenced. At no time did the demonstration assume the appearance or the attitude of a disorganized mob. All of the details were managed with the discipline and precision of a perfectly trained military organization. The response was swift and brutal. Federal troops were called in. Along with gun-toting thugs hired by the company, they arrested every man they could find, not just miners. Even a doctor and a postmaster were swept up in the arrests. More than 1,000 men were arrested. They were held in a makeshift bullpen made from a converted barn. Some were held as long as a year without any formal charges filed until the unionization effort was crushed. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. You're listening to The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. <laughs> So last week, some good news in the work of labor and uh, and good on the Biden administration. You know, two of the big things, obviously, Federal Trade Commission banned uh, non-competes. The Department of Labor uh, expanded overtime protection to millions of workers, raising the threshold. Also, also uh, the administration and good on them announced the final rule uh, at MSHA protecting miners and construction workers from deadly silica exposure Again, things that are moving in the right direction, but but things that Republican judges could conceivably overturn. Something Democrats pushed for, something Republicans will certainly want to overturn. And look, if Trump gets the chance, we'll certainly, certainly overturn it. Some good news in the, wor- the, in the world of labor. Uh, the UAW reached a deal with Daimler Truck. Uh, and, and look, the, uh, the vote with Mercedes in Alabama is coming up. Uh, but they announced a tentative agreement with the uh, the truck and bus manufacturer uh, that you know could have could have seen a strike of more than seven thousand workers. Uh, so the four year agreement just before the deadline, uh, evidently it is a six year agreement. Uh, there's some really good stuff in this. Wage increases more than twenty five percent over the next four years and cost of living adjustments. Uh, good stuff. And look, look, I'm looking forward to that uh, uh, that vote in Tuscaloosa at the Mercedes plant sometime in early May. So we'll see, even though the, you know, the governors across the South are pushing, no, 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 red states are kind of freaking out. And I look at the most recent victory in a red state, Kansas, uh, overwhelmingly the uh, the Kansas, the, the faculty and the folks at the University of Kansas uh, voted overwhelmingly 850 to 132 in favor of unionizing. Uh, they uh, organized with the Association of American Universities. Uh, their their salaries rank 34th out of 38 public inst- institutions. So this could this could help make lives better in that world. Also, uh, Steelworkers Front, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, they announced uh, the University of Pittsburgh faculty. Uh, they have a tentative agreement on their first contract uh, and that will cover more than 3,000 Pitt faculty members who voted to organize, if you remember, back in 2022 or 2021, the fall of 2021. Uh, so good on them for getting that first contract. That's that's always that's always tough. It will run through June 30th of 2026. Also in Pittsburgh, uh, workers at the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh overwhelmingly voted to join the United Steelworkers. Uh, so there are now 65 new union workers there. They are the uh, event staff. They're the cleaning people. They're the exhibit technicians. They're the people who put it on. Uh, they're the folks you meet when you walk in the door. They're, they're the Children's Museum. So good on them. Good on the workers uh, for, for you know, look, say we, we, need, we need representation. 
Uh, and there is so much more. The Starbucks situation is moving in the right direction, it looks. And I'll tell you, I'll be the first to say, never thought Starbucks would come around. There is negotiations going on. So that a huge, huge thing. But I come back to, uh, and the reason I said a minute ago at the University of Pitt getting that first contract, such a big thing is that a lot of a lot of places they vote for unions they the members want it the people want it the workers want it uh but our laws are 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 a little outdated uh, a little behind the times and the need to encourage i use the word encourage uh an agreement to happen is important and again as i said last week i this is why i supported the employee free choice act even though i never thought it went far enough uh, it did mandate uh increased fines for for employers who break the law, uh, it did put in place uh, the first contract arbitration. And, you know, I had somebody email me and say, well, why would you want that first contract arbitration? You know, you, can't you come to an agreement and go, look, at the end of the day, both sides want to come to the table and make an agreement if there's the, the threat of someone else imposing on them. Uh, so for me, this idea that, hey, we're going to we're going to make sure that there's a contract. We're going to make sure that workers are covered. We're going to make sure that employers get their say in it. It sounds it's, it's the way it should be. And I don't want government imposing contracts. I want both sides sitting down fairly negotiating it. Uh, but if one side, generally the employers, uh, are recalcitrant and saying no, 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 well, somebody's got to step in and move that along. Just my thoughts. I want to hear yours, though. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program? Uh, grab the podcast audio at the website, the ricksmithshow.com, or any of your podcast players, video, freespeech.org. As always, appreciate you being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. At Rick at the Rick Smith Show.com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.